Okay, welcome, Chris. Hello. Um, all right, so I'm Chris Walls. I'm the property manager at Long Pasture. Uh, I oversee a Schumet Holly, Skunk Net River, Barnesville Great Marsh, as well as Long Pasture, all based from here at Long Pasture. I do everything you do for your own homes or pay somebody to do, uh, landscaper, painter, mechanic, carpenter, uh, janitor, I do everything. Uh, but I also get to do programs because I have interest in birds. Uh, and and um, it's now two o'clock. I don't know if you can hear my, my bird clock is, is singing. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen here and we'll get started. So first of all, when it comes to identifying birds, especially common birds or backyard birds when you don't know anything, uh, there's a lot of different resources. Uh, first of all, you get a field guide, a book, you know, whether that's a uh, field guide to North America or Eastern US or specifically to Massachusetts or to Cape Cod. Uh, when you're beginning, it's always best to start with a field guide for your local uh, area, especially if you don't know a whole lot. And then as you get better and start identifying common birds, and you can get books for different regions and learn those. Uh, one good resource, which is basically an online field guide, uh, is allaboutbirds.org. It's run by the Cornell University of Ornithology Lab in New York. Um, See, it's just all about birds. You click on it and it brings you up to, basically it's an online field guide. You can search specific birds. You can uh, also uh, just skim through. Uh, they have live cameras, which you can watch in different areas of the country and the world. Uh, you can go, it has, you know, a bird guide, bird ID skills, feeding birds, when, answer a lot of different questions just from navigating this website. Um, so first I'm gonna go over uh, a few groups of birds that are tough to tell the differences. It's uh, finches and sparrows. And then we'll go, uh, and then I'll talk about some other birds. So first of all, you see here, we got a uh, house finch. Uh, differences between house finches and sparrows are not very, much between them. Let's see here. Can I go and compare? Won't well, let me compare. All right. Uh, so typically house finch or finches have more color and they're sexually dimorphic, meaning males and females look different. Whereas in sparrows, the males and females look the same. Uh, some other things to look at are the shape and thickness of the beak. Uh, sparrows are generally large seed eaters, uh, so they need a thicker, stronger beak to break seed open, whereas finches can eat, will eat smaller seeds. Um, thistle and safflower are some of them. Uh, another feat, uh, feat, uh, uh, behavioral field mark uh, would be uh, finches will generally be in flocks you know, small flocks of five or six, or it could be as much as 15 to 30, um, depending on which species of finch. Uh, sparrows will generally be by themselves in groups of two or three or, or just in single individuals. And then they just gather at the feeders. So you might see three, or, three to five song sparrows or as many as 20, but they're all kind of foraging and looking on their own. Uh, so if if they flush from danger, then they all, they all go in their separate ways, whereas finches will flush together and stay in that flock for safety. Uh, so you can see uh, male house finches have color and uh, it's a rosy red. Uh, the females are show no color, just brown and, and white, but you can see that the shape of the bill here it's good for seed eating. And uh, when we go to a white-throated sparrow, you can see that it's uh, more pointed and there's less of a curve than on the house finch. And most of the time finches will feed from the feeders themselves, whereas sparrows 
tend to feed on the ground, uh, scratching around in the grass looking uh, for, for food items. Now, um, there are two finches we get here regularly, and they are the house finch and the purple finch. A lot of people say that they saw a purple finch uh, in the summer or, oh, I've got a purple finch nesting on my porch in the reef that I left up. Well, that's a behavior of house finches. Uh, one way to tell the difference between the two is as uh, seasonally is purple finches are usually only around in the fall and in the winter here on the Cape. Uh, you can see the shape of the beak here is different between the two, just a little bit. There's more of a curve on the house finch than the purple finch. And one way uh, is a purple finch looks like it was dipped in raspberry sauce. So you can see the red up in the face here on the house finch and in the breast, but there's still brown streaking. Uh, whereas the purple finch extends down into the back and the streaks on the, on the breast and bellies are pink. Uh, and then of course the, the females, which you wanna look for, is this mark in the face on purple finches. Uh, you can see that they've got a white pale eyebrow and a white mark under the eye, whereas the house finch doesn't have that. So if you see some, and, and house fi purple finches are a little bit bigger. So look for them at your feeders. I had one at my feeder just uh, on Saturday uh, and it was a female. So it, at first I, even without binoculars, I had, to, I, I had to be sure I got my binoculars out and looked. Uh, we get plenty of sparrows uh, here on the Cape. Uh, of course, our uh, here's our song sparrow. Uh, so our song sparrow is year round. They sing year round. Uh, they can be in any habitat, uh, backyards and lawns, golf courses, beaches and the dunes and, and wooded areas and edges. Uh, White-throated sparrows are really only here fall through spring. They leave and go to higher elevations and points north to, for breeding during the summer. Uh, so they're starting to come back this time of year. Uh, the males have the white chin uh, with the black and white cap and this yellow spot above in front of the eye. Now there's a tan striped version, which shows it here uh, where it doesn't have the white. Uh, but it still has the white throat and there is a pale yellow patch uh, in the lower just behind the beak. Uh, some other birds here, white crown sparrows we do get in the winter, uh, though they're less common. Uh, so that's another black and white capped sparrow, but it's got a pink bill compared to the house uh, white-throated sparrow's black bill. Uh, and then and that's, those are west coast and back, okay. Um, another sparrow, I got to click on this search, uh, American tree sparrow. There's another sparrow that we get in the winters here. Uh, they look a lot like chipping sparrows. So there should be a species to compare with the chipping, there it is. So chipping sparrows are here in this, in the summer. Uh, you can see some similarities here, uh, white wing bars, uh, a, a stripe through the eye on both of them, a rusty cap, uh, but a chipping sparrow has, this is non-breeding, we want to see breeding. No, it's, all right. And so a breeding adult chipping sparrow, you can see right there. Rusty cap with a black eye line and a black beak. And they change so that in the winter they look different. So in the winter they do look like this. They don't have as dark as a rusty cap. They still have it, the black eye line, the pink beak, the wing bars. And when you compare the two, and you know, because you should be seeing chipping sparrow in the winter, it looks like this along with the tree sparrow. You can see the tree sparrow has a bicolored bill, meaning it's got two different colors in its beak. Uh, and it's got this dark black central spot with a clean breast. Uh, 
and we can find lots of them in the winter here at Long Pasture and they like to come to the feeders and they'll come to your feeders as well. Uh, as long as you have some open uh, habitat along with wooded edge because they need the thicket for cover. Now, um, some local woodpeckers that we've get. We got the downy woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker. Uh, easiest and easiest way to tell the difference between these two species is a beak length uh, and to see them both together at the same time. Uh, the downy woodpecker is much smaller. Uh, it has black dots on its outer white tail feathers, whereas the hairy woodpecker usually doesn't. Uh, both male and most male woodpeckers of every species has red on the head. Uh, females will not have a red patch. That's a video, there's the female. So see, she's missing the red patch. Um, the other way to tell the difference is to look at their beak. You can see here the beak is half the length of the head to the back, whereas on the hairy woodpecker, the beak's much longer and it's about equal to the length of the head. And when you see them both at the same time, uh, it's very easy to tell the difference. And sometimes, do they have it? Um, they will show a picture of both of these birds together in the same. Oh, maybe the hairy woodpecker would. Um, yeah, there we go. I knew they had one. Uh, so here's a good example of the two together on a suet uh, feeder. And actually that's the feeder that, uh, up at the Sapsucker Woods in Ithaca, New York. Uh, that's on the feeder cam that I also have open. So here you can clearly see the size difference. Uh, it's about a third larger. The beak is as long as the head, whereas the downy woodpecker, it's a very short beak. Uh, we do have both of them here. And uh, but though the downy woodpecker is predominantly the most more abundant than the hairy woodpecker. Um, and of course, you know, they different feeds and see uh, to see them. Uh, to get them to your to your yard is the best way to draw in all birds. It's just a variety of food, a variety of types of feeders, and I'll go over that shortly. Uh, but I wanted to go over a few more woodpeckers uh, that are easily confused. Um, a lot of times, uh, people will say I saw a red-headed woodpecker at my feeders. This is a red-headed woodpecker. And if I go down here, compare red-bellied woodpecker. So the red-bellied woodpecker is the one that we get at the feeders regularly uh, here on the Cape. Red-headed woodpeckers are rare on Cape Cod. Um, they do turn up occasionally, uh, but they're typically farther west in Massachusetts. And you can see that the red covers the entire head from the neck up uh, for a male. Uh, and they've got a large white wing patch, black, black wing back. Um, the females and juveniles are muted in colors, don't show the full red head. Or sorry, uh, females and males look the same. Um, and then with the red-bellied woodpecker, which is the one that we have here regularly, you can see uh, it's more just like a, a hairdo or a mullet. It goes all the way down the back of the neck. Um, and a uh, female will be missing the, some red right there in the face. We'll go to, to that there. So you can see there's the female. She's missing some red in the front, whereas the male has the entire red on the head. And they have a zebra pattern, pattern or black and white stripe pattern on their back. And in flight, let's see if they have one here. Nope. Um, woodpeckers are unique in that they use their tail 
you can see right here as a third leg for support. So when they're on the tree, they're always head up. They're, they don't, can't go down the tree head first. Uh, those are nut hatches. Um, nut hatches are not woodpeckers, uh, but they, they eat some of the same foods and show some similar behaviors. Another abundant woodpecker that we get is the northern flicker. And it's a yellow sh a red shafted there. We want a yellow shafted. So there's a two different subspecies. There's a yellow shafted, which is on the east coast, and a red shafted, which is on the west coast. And that sh shaft color refers to the color underneath the feathers and the flight feathers and the tail and the wings. Uh, so a red shafted flicker has red underneath and it has a red mustache instead of a black mustache. Uh, and then when their late ranges overlap, uh, you get orange, uh, though I'm not sure if they're still considered red shafted or yellow shafted, uh, but you do see some variation in the colors where they overlap and can interbreed. But the males have the mustache and the red on the back of the head. And that's not a female. And there we go. This is a female yellow shafted. You see, she does have the red spot in the head, but she doesn't have the mustache. Uh, these woodpeckers, um, a lot of times they are up in the trees, but quite frequently you, you can see them on the ground eating ants or at bases of trees. So they're not just up in the treetops and they're a large woodpecker uh, for us. And uh, another one here that we sometimes get uh, is what you might back in the old west might have called somebody it was yellow bellied. Um, we had the yellow bellied sap sucker. Uh, they there we go. Um, you can see they've got red in the throat and up on the forehead with a white wing patch right in the right there. That's diagnostic between males and females. Um, females do not have the red in the throat just up on the forehead. And one unique feature, feeding behavior from sap suckers is they make neat rows uh, in the bark to cause the sap to drip. And they don't actually eat the sap. What they do is they look for insects that get caught in the sap. So by creating all these little holes and, uh, and rings around the tree branches and, and trunks, uh, insects get trapped in the sap and then they check them regularly uh, for insects. So you can tell wh whether a sap sucker has been in the area just based on uh, evidence in the trees. All right, and now I'll show you the two nut hatches uh, that we get up here. We've got the white breasted nut hatch. Uh, diagnostic behavior of nut hatches is that they go down up, they can go down trees head first, uh, and they don't need to use their tail as a third leg. Uh, they're quite strong and able to walk upside down on the underside of a branch. Uh, males have a completely black cap uh, with gray back and wings, and the females have a, a slight a grayer forehead with a, a black nape. Uh, and you can see, uh, here we go. So really, once you start exploring this website, you get, you, you'll spend hours on it, uh, uh, just going through photos, videos, uh, and other information. And one thing that you can also do, which I haven't shown you as you go over, let's see, there's the overview. So I'll show you their range, like a range map, uh, and the different food uh, that, that they eat, uh, where they nest, how many eggs uh, they lay, uh, how long it takes for it to incubate, different behaviors. So it really is like having the book. The only difference is from the book is you get these videos and sounds. Yeah. 
You see he's picking into the crevices of the tree bark, looking for different types of insects and, uh, and bugs, spiders, caterpillars. Uh, now the other nut hatch that we got is the red breasted nut hatch. It's smaller than the white breasted, but very similar. You can see the beak shape is a little bit different. It's more upturned uh, with a flat top on the red breasted. Uh, they've got a black eye stripe and they've got a, a little bit of red wash here uh, in the breast. And you can see the difference between the male and the female. Male has the darker, more prominent colors uh, and the female's colors are muted, uh, but she still shows the eye stripe and the general pigmentation, the dark uh, the grays and blacks. Um, you see this one is excavating a nest cavity, pulling out dead wood, going back in, pulling some more out. She'll probably pause to look for predators or danger and make sure nobody's watching her. A lot of times these smaller birds, uh, nut hatches, even chickadees will spend a lot of time excavating like this and may not use that nest site uh, that year uh, or at all. Um, it takes them so long to excavate because they, they aren't like true woodpeckers. Uh, so they can't, they don't, they can only excavate rotten wood already. Um, so they're pulling out small pieces of debris Whereas the bigger woodpeckers can actually take out chunks of live wood that get in the way. Um, all right, so those are the nut hatches. I'm going to go on quickly. Let's see here. So we do have uh, see bird friendly homes, I think, is this. Uh, so when you want to attract birds to your yard, you got to provide three things. That's food, shelter, and water. Um, now shelter can be nest boxes. Shelter can be shrubs and bushes and trees uh, just for cover, for, for protection from predators. Uh, and, uh, you know, water would be, you know, bird baths. Um, bird baths can take many forms. Uh, something that can be just, just a simple puddle on the ground uh, holding water. It could be the water dripping from your hose uh, and the birds will find it. Or you can have a bird bath that you fill and, and it, or it could, be, it could, could be connected to uh, an electric pump that then circulates the water because uh, water that sits still grows algae, collects debris, uh, can uh, become a, a breeding ground for mosquitoes. So by having a pump circulating the water, it keeps it fresh, it keeps it clean. Um, you can, you know, you just have to fill it because it'll evaporate a little bit faster as it splashes and moves around. Uh, and you also don't want a deep bird bath um, and a bath with steps. So basically uh, bigger birds can go into deeper water. So you think of like wading shorebirds. So they got the short legs, like the sandpipers that chase the waves, they can't go very deep. And then you get birds like the willets that can stand in water and the great blue herons that can stand in deeper water. Uh, so when you put in a bird bath, uh, you need something with different levels, uh, whether it's water pouring over rocks in the bird bath or a tiered step system that allows hummingbirds to bathe in one spot and then larger birds to use another spot. Uh, one of the big reasons birds don't use a bird bath is because it's too deep for them to access. There's the, the floor of the bath is too smooth and they can't get any grip to stand, if, especially if it's a very deep bowl with a, a steep slope 
because uh, they have no grip, they'll slip. Larger birds could stand on the edge and dip their heads in and, and bathe themselves. Uh, but it, this, you know, Cornell website here has a lot of information about bird baths. Um, one of the uh, hardest times for birds to get water is in the winter. I know that driving into long pasture in the winter in the mornings um, and later through the day as the, the snow and the ice melt in the roads, uh, they start drinking from the puddles. Uh, unfortunately, depending on how much salt is spread in an area that can contaminate the water. Uh, so it's not good to provide a, a source for them. Um, you can buy heaters uh, that you can place into your bird baths. Uh, there's some of them are separate. Some are incorporated into the bird baths themselves. Uh, you could also make sure you put it in, uh, on a, in a sunny spot in the yard so that the, the sun melts the top layers of snow and, and creates a little bit of water. Uh, and just want to be ca cautious with uh, cleaning, um, one of the, especially when it comes to feeding. So when you're providing food uh, and feeders and bird baths, is just, you want to make sure you clean them regularly. You don't want, the, uh, you can see here's one topic here. What should I do if I find algae in my bird bath? So uh, it says scrub it, clean it, do all those things. All this information's here. I've only got a little bit of a, of, uh, a limited time schedule. So I'm going to, I'm going to point you in these directions and then you can read about them. Um, and then the next step for feeding birds uh, would be, uh, let's see, do they have one here? Yeah, wildlife value of a messy garden. Um, so plantings, native plants, uh, you know, the birds evolved uh, with these plants at the same time. So they learned which plants they can eat, which ones they can't, uh, which ones at certain times of the year. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're in fall now, we're approaching winter. So a lot of the birds are going to be uh, feed, they're not feeding on insects as much because the insects aren't as active. Some of them are up in the trees like this, this um, uh, there are some the pill bugs or sow bugs, roly polies, um, little things that go dormant and hide in the bark and they can, they get picked out by some some birds, but they also plants that provide um, berries uh, like holly, bayberry, ivy, uh, dogwood. And, um, and if you provide plantings that provide food throughout the year, so you get uh, things like crab apples and honeysuckle and spice bush, which flower in the spring and provide f uh, flowers for uh, and plants for nectaring, like. Uh, uh, butterfly weed and witch hazel. Uh, they all uh, provide food at different times of the year based on whether they're flowering or providing a fruit like the apples. Uh, Orioles, like a lot of apple trees, uh, we get them along with the uh, sap uh, wax wings and some other warblers in our orchard here at Long Pasture. Uh, and then feeding birds in the fall with sunflower. Uh, they eat the seeds after the uh, after that, uh, you also get plants like Virginia creeper that have their berries are, are out now. Uh, high bush blueberry and pokeweed, um, they'll, they'll flower and then uh, go to seed and you show berries. <clears throat> and uh, by providing food at different times of the year, you're, provide, you're helping some of those birds that are here throughout the year. Uh, some you're helping through just migration. Um, and uh, besides that, you know, the cover uh, helps protect them, especially uh, when you put in uh, pines and grasses uh, that keep their needles throughout the winter and create dense cover. So cedar trees, hollies that still hold their leaves. Um, birds are looking for, they're not going to sit in, the, in an oak or a cherry tree that has no leaves for, for protection. They're going to sit in thickets and wooded areas and brush. Uh, so having pine trees in areas helps uh, with some protective co cover for some birds. They'll also eat the nuts and the berries from spruce and juniper uh, and hickories and beech. Uh, and the spring beech and so those, those trees provide flowers for the insects, which is food for the birds, uh, as well as the, the fruits and the nuts uh, through the fall and winter. 
All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about bird feeders. And to do so, we're gonna watch some go on right here. So I got, um, so Cornell, they have live feeder cams. And the one on the left is uh, Sapsucker Woods at their campus in Ithaca. Um, you can see it's 41, degree, 41 degrees there now and overcast. And then we have uh, a feeder in Ontario, Canada. You can see it's 27 degrees. It's, uh, there's a light snow cover, uh, so some snow falling. Uh, stuff soon to come for us. Uh, but you can see there's different types of feeders here. There's a platform feeder, uh, which if you can get a mix of seeds on. So you get birds that are too big to hang on the feeders, like the platform feeders or off the ground with sparrows. Uh, you want to put multiple different types of seeds. So you can see the, the feeders on the left, uh, the empty one was full of peanuts uh, an hour and a half ago uh, when I first turned these on. And uh, then there's the one post in the middle. This is the one picture that had the, the downy woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker. It was standing, they were on that suet feeder. You got another suet feeder here with a, looks like they turned a tr natural log into a feeder by drilling some holes and putting suet into it. Um, it looks like they got a mix of corn and here, let me zoom in here. Mix of corn, safflower, and I don't see any sunflower seeds unless they're sunflower hearts. So you can buy seed without the shells on them. Uh, the shells create a mess. Uh, that's another one of the problems with feeders is uh, don't just constantly refill them every day or every couple of days. Uh, have a few feeders, a couple of feeders on reserve. So you got two clean ones in the garage. You take the dirty ones in, you put the clean ones out, you clean the dirty ones and um, that way the food supply is always there. See that there's a tufted titmouse uh, going after the peanuts. Uh, those look like shelled peanuts or maybe even uh, suet balls. Uh, so there are suet cakes, which you put in the cage. There's, you can make your own suet. They have suet balls that go into these little cages that, and tube feeders. Um, there are feeders that keep squirrels off of them. Uh, or larger birds, uh, when they sit on them or step on them, it drops the sleeve down over the tube and over the port opening so that they can't get to those, uh, to that seed. And it, they do really well at keeping the squirrels away. You can also put baffles underneath the feeders um, on the pole and up above. Uh, the one thing I haven't seen at either of these locations has been a squirrel since I started watching them today. Uh, and Oh, let me turn the sound on. That's what I didn't do. Um, so this is up in Ontario. Uh, with, it's with a platform feeder, what they've got here is two trays. Uh, it's really, it's a screen. So by having the seed on a, on a screen tray, any rain and water will drip through the screen and keep the seed dry. Because once the seed gets wet and then sits, uh, eventually it'll grow mold, which is one of the reasons I don't I uh, use thistle seeds in my feeders. Um, volunteers tend to overfill those and you put in too much. Uh, if we have a tube feeder for thistle, uh, I wouldn't fill it more than the top, uh, the first level here, uh, because there's so many seeds because they're so small and it's hard to go through them. Even the birds that prefer, uh, would eat thistle seed, prefer sunflower if you're providing sunflower. If all you had out was a thistle or a Niger seed, then they would take they would take it. Um, you see here, there's a mix of black sunflower, some other seeds, some peanuts. You got so this is a peanut or suet ball feeder here. Uh, you got some hopper tray feeders. Uh, this this one looks like it's only for smaller birds because uh, of the openings here. Uh, so there's all different types of feeders and the more types you provide and the more se different seeds you provide, the more uh, different species you'll get. Now, um, I was surprised when uh, the staff person, the, whoever runs this feeding station came out and put out macaroni and cheese. 
and being freezing temperatures, it's frozen into clumps. Um, and I saw a crow come and take some macaroni and cheese. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I've never heard about putting it out specifically. Uh, it's a neat idea. I guess if you if the kid your kid drops some on the our grandkid drops some on the floor, you can put it out and the crows will find it. Uh, blue jays have been coming. There's a chickadee sitting here in the bush, so you can see the cover near the feeders gives them a spot a spot to stop. Uh, if your feeders are out in the middle of the yard and there's no cover nearby, it means that the birds have to go a greater distance exposed to danger uh, to get to the food source. So by having shrubs nearby, it provides cover and protection. But you have to be careful because with protect cover like that, uh, sometimes neighborhood outdoor cats that people insist on having and keeping can hide under those bushes. So we got a couple of blackbirds here. We got a red winged blackbird here, and we have a European starling. And honestly, I'm surprised there's only one of each, probably just because of the location. If you were in a spot like Hyannis uh, or right in Falmouth, uh, where you got more buildings and more streets, uh, and you're going to get more birds in flocks and groups of these, uh, same with house sparrows. Whereas up in Ithaca, out in Sapsucker Woods, where they're probably sort of remote, uh, I've only been seeing one starling here at a time. And I've seen this, a few red-winged blackbirds, morning dove. Um, so usually these birds are on the ground, starlings, red-winged blackbirds, and morning doves. If there's seed on the ground, they'll take that first. These birds are only up on the feeders because there's nothing on the ground. When you put seed on the ground, you got to be careful because some towns are now putting in ordinances about bird feeding because of irresponsible own feeders that don't clean up their areas uh, afterwards. Uh, every week or two, you should be cleaning up the seed husks and throwing them out and uh, try not to overfeed. If you put too much seed on the ground, then rats, uh, I mean, the chipmunks and the squirrels appreciate it, but People don't want to feed rats, so then they, and then to try to get rid of the rats, they put out poison, and then the rats don't die right away. They get outside, and then they're eaten by owls and hawks. So, if you have a rat problem, take the feeders in, stop feeding for a couple of weeks, put out rat traps and snap traps, um, and that's the best way to do it. Because um, even non-secondary pesticides to kill that aren't supposed to kill owls could kill them if they eat enough mice that are holding the, those ingredients in their systems. So uh, you can see right there, there is a pecking order when it comes to birds at the feeder. Um, there are, especially, it's easy to see in chickadees as well. We just saw this morning dove chase away the other one. Uh, larger chickadees and uh, ones higher up in the, in the hierarchy uh, will actually get to feed first. When they fly in, uh, the other chickadees will step aside and let them eat, and then they'll take their turns. Uh, uh, so the, the term pecking order is there for a reason. Uh, well, most times it's ref when referring to chickens, uh, but it's also visible at, at our feeders. Uh, oh, there's a, the red-breasted nuthatch just came in and took a seed and left. So a lot of birds, uh, especially chickadees, uh, nuthatches, they, what they like to do is they'll come in, they'll grab one peanut or one sunflower seed, and then they'll fly off. And what they're doing is they're going to protective cover so that they can pop open because they have to hold the seed with their foot and then tap at it with their beak to pop it open to get to the seed uh, and, pop, and get rid of the shell. Whereas finches, and sparrows, which have seed eating beaks, because chickadees and nuthatches are eating insects, uh, the seed eaters can crack the shells and eat the seed all right there. And that's why you get a pile of seed husks around where they were feeding. So cardinals um, like they can do the same. Blue jays, uh, they typically will come in, eat several peanuts or as much seed as they can and fill their crop and then fly off. Um, and sometimes even the chickadees and nuthatches are creating a cache 
where they fly away, they hide seed under bark on trees, and then they remember where all those seeds are so that when uh, a winter storm comes, uh, they have a food source that they know they can go find. Uh, so a lot of times, if you're not seeing them at your feeders or if the feeders are empty for a day or two, then they will go to those food stores that they've set aside. Uh, but birds will not die if you don't feed them. I typically don't feed our birds uh, either at my house or at the sanctuary in the summer uh, because there's lots of natural food sources. I might fill them once in a while or keep one or two filled just for visitor experience. Uh, but there's plenty of food for them in the summer and then even in the fall through the winter. Uh, as I look out the window, I can see some viburnum uh, berries and privet berries and they will they may not be able to digest them now, but after a couple of frosts, uh, it helps break down the, the, the fruits and it makes it easier for certain birds to eat them. Uh, so there's always plenty of food. Um, typically, I will feed only in the winter. Uh, I only feed suet in the winter when it's cold, so it's harder. It doesn't fall apart as easy and they don't go through it as fast. Uh, and especially make sure that my feeders are filled before storms. So if I know that a big nor'easter is coming either with wind and rain or snow, especially I'll make sure that feeders are full. And if there's several inches of snow on the ground, make sure you clear the snow out from under the feeders. Um, and that way it gives a spot for the ground birds like morning doves and sparrows and cardinals to, to find seed. Um, and then having uh, several feeders at once, you can get multiple uh, feed, much more activity. If you only have one feeder, then they all have to take their turns. The cardinals come in, they scare away the other birds, um, the red-winged blackbirds, and then the, all the small birds will have to wait and take their, take their turn. Um, all right, so uh, are there any questions popping up? I, I'm not see and let's see here not a lot someone asked about the time of year where we shouldn't fill bird feeders but you just answered that oh yeah <laughs> about is there anything else and you know if someone wants they can unmute themselves and ask too because it doesn't seem like it's too crazy All or right. you can type something while you're waiting yeah whatever we'll just so that the, you know this is this is what bird watching is now, you know, it's just sitting up and looking out your window at what happens to fly by, what comes to the feeders. Um, granted, this is the topic is backyard birds. So uh, if you are a birder, then you would go out looking for birds, uh, different habitats, different species. Uh, but bird being a bird watcher and just you can you can still report what you see. So birders will go out and they'll find birds and they'll report them to Cornell's uh, eBird, which uh, relies on c science, uh, citizen scientists to make observations and report them. And then Cornell uses those data points and observations to track bird populations and abundance. Um, and they have uh, feeder watch days where you can report the birds you see at your feeders. And you could do that every day of the year, but they have a special uh, campaign where they try to get people to do it at a certain day and certain times of the year so that they can then see what birds are actively coming to feeders. Uh, and then if you can learn birds by song, uh, the Ontario feeder, I heard some evening grosbeaks fly by, uh, which don't typically, they're large finches that come down into New England and where the last couple of years have been turning up on Cape Cod and in southeastern Mass. Um, they're not a regular occurring finch, but we can get them. Well, now we're getting a few questions. Do you want to look at the chat or do you want to read uh, yep, Sure. So, oh yeah, we've got a handful now. I'll do them in order. Um, why is the red-bellied woodpecker called that since it doesn't have red on its belly? Yeah, no. Uh, well, it does have red on its belly, and it's just not easy to find. So what happens is, unfortunately, most birds were named 
after they were shot and held in the hand. So the semi-palmated sandpiper, which has slight webbing between its toes, was named because the person holding it in its hand could see the webbing between its toes. Um, in the spring and high breeding season, that's not a good, there we go. That's why it's called a red belly. So this is the breast. This is the belly down here. Uh, so somebody who had first identified this bird called it a red bellied woodpecker. Um, now, whether they saw this bird first or saw the true red headed woodpecker first, and it, they probably could have named this red headed. Um, but yeah, not every bird is named for uh, what's the most obvious field mark, like the ring necked duck. And I know it's not a, but here's a good example. Whoops, ring necked duck. So there's some, they change bird names pretty often, a lot of times. And one of the arguments for this duck is it should be called the red, uh, the uh, ring billed duck, because you can clearly see a white ring around its bill uh, easily from a distance. But if we find the right picture here, um, yeah, this right here. So there's a slight ring around its neck. So that's what it was named for. Uh, whether or not the powers that be and the people that change bird names decide they want to change it to ring billed duck, uh, opposed to ring necked, um, might happen someday. But we got a few more. Um, by cleaning up under feeders, do you mean getting whatever's been dropped? We did get mice one year and have never put up feeders since. Oh uh, yeah, that's exactly why the the mice. It's you know they're not clean eaters, so so seed turns up on the ground. Birds look for it on the ground. They don't find all of it, and then you get the mice and the rats that might look for the seed at night. Um, so by raking up everything that's there and throwing it away periodically, or um, what you can do is use one of these platform feeders and put it underneath the hanging feeders. So by ha that kind of catches everything and then it could make for easier disposal. Uh, but cleaning it regularly should mitigate any uh, rodent uh, pests that you end up with. Okay, and someone asked, can you show more sapsucker variations? Variations. Um, all right, well, there's multiple species of sapsuckers. Um, the yellow-bellied sapsucker is the one we get. And if I go through the pictures here, so that's a adult male. You see the bright red. Um, mm -hmm. he, you can see in the tail here that there's no white on the outer edges. Then uh, they do have, it's a juvenile, mostly brown. And is it this one? Yeah. So that, that field mark right there, the black wing with the white patch, that's easily to, easy to recognize. Um, the other is males and females both show red in the front of the head rather than the back, like all of the other woodpeckers. And you can see there's not very little white in their tail. And then you can see here's the yellow on the belly that they get named for. Um, the other sap suckers, you know, they named for, you can see the red naped sap sucker here. So you can see it's very similar. Uh, it's the, um, very similar. This one's got a little more red on the back of its head, less white throughout the body. So um, when, it, when it comes to identifying all birds, like I, I get people and friends from other countries asking me, what bird is this? And I'm not, I don't know all the birds of the world. There's 10,000, there's too many to know. Um, but everybody recognizes a duck and everybody recognizes a hawk or an eagle. Um, so once you break it down to, or, or it looks like a woodpecker, and then now that's narrowed down your search. And then by looking at where in the world it's from, you, like if you have a guide for, if you see something that looks like this and you think you have a red nape, nape sap sucker in your yard, the first thing you wanna look at is the range map. And if it tells you it's only in California and the West Coast and you're living in Massachusetts or New York, 
it's highly unlikely that it's a red-naped sapsucker. But there are occasions where these random weird birds show up and um, actually let's talk about inside. I just went to Rhode Island yesterday to see a, a shorebird that a sandpiper that should be in Australia right now. But I'll mention a bird that's right here in Wellfleet that should be down in Texas and Mexico right now. And it's a tropical kingbird at Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary. And you can see from its range map right here that it lives, you know, you can see right here in a very tip of southern tip of Texas, up into Arizona, it, the bread is breeding. So that's where it is in height of the summer. And all this purple is year round range. So this bird um, should be down in here somewhere right now in South America or Central America, and it somehow turned up uh, with this most recent rainstorm in Nor'easter uh, in Massachusetts, along with a lot of other birds. Uh, so I always check the range map because there's a very similar bird, Western Kingbird here. Um, so Western Kingbirds are typically on the West Coast. You see how similar they are. The wing's a little darker, a mm -hmm. uh, little more gray in the head, for uh, a Western Kingbird. But the, what makes a Western Kingbird more likely here is its range map. Um, oh, come on. Uh, maps, there we go. Uh, you, so you can see in the summer, it's all right through here, migration down into Mexico and in the winter, Central America. So to get a Western Kingbird here in New England is a lot less far-fetched than a tropical Kingbird. Uh, the one that's there in Wellfleet right now is only the second recorded sighting or observations of a tropical Kingbird on Cape Cod. Both of them were this year. Um, and there's only been a couple more times. I thought I heard rain. Um, only a couple more times where they've showed up in the state. Oh, and a couple more. Um, so. Someone says that when they put out shelled sunflower seeds, do they need to be fresh or can they use some of the leftover seed from the spring? Uh, as long as it's not growing mold uh, and you've kept it dry and in a, a container, then it should be fine. Okay. And also someone said, I heard we're not supposed to be feeding birds here this year because of a virus. Okay. That was uh, over last winter um, or, or this or last spring. What was it? Is it spring? That's what it was. Um, so what happened was, yes, there was some concern that some blackbirds, blue jays, uh, were sh showing um, odd behaviors and dying. And as a precaution, they said take down feeders because feeders are. Uh, it's it's kind of like when COVID was going around. They said, okay, shut everything down because people cut congregating in areas can easily spread it. So by having feeders up, birds can spread disease. Um, one disease that is prevalent is basically, it's a pink eye for birds. Um, and finches are prone to it. And if their eyes get swollen and shut, what you should do is take your feeders down, clean them. Don't put the feeders up for a couple of weeks so that those birds can disperse, stay away from each other, and then they stop spreading it. Uh, but what they determined was uh, what was affecting these birds was actually uh, either um, it was something to do with the cicadas that were emerging from the ground. Uh, so either the cicadas had a bacteria or a fungus or something that uh, when they died or when they were eaten, it transferred to the birds and then the birds were getting sick. Uh, they figured this out by looking at uh, map ranges for where the, they were finding the birds that were dying and showing, exhibiting these symptoms and correlating them to the emergence of cicadas and the ranges that they were happening. And they determined that it was happening at the same time in the same spots. Um, and once the cicadas kind of were done, then, uh, but we've been, uh, they, as a precaution, they still kept them down, but we've been able to put feeders back up for a few months now. And someone asked, can we make our own suet? Is this advisable? Yeah, you can do that. Yep. Um, there are lots of recipes online. Um, I happened to find a couple of videos while I was, I just did a quick search for 
different feeder types and suet feeder types. And um, there's all sorts of recipes using uh, bacon fat and grease and mixing in peanut butter and bird seed and freezing it. Um, so yeah, if you if you want to make your own suet, then you, you uh, they might even have some recipes on the Cornell page here. Okay. Um, any other questions? Oh, we have Chris. We'll give it a moment. Yep, yeah, this no is this has been a great. Yeah, no problem watching the papers. <laughs> this has been great, though. That's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I keep these tabs in a full file on my website as under time killers. So <laughs> when I'm here in the office, I'll open up one of these feeder cams. Um, um, there are other sites that show cameras that are nest cams. So you can watch eagle nests, osprey nests, hummingbird nests. Um, you can watch watering holes in Africa if you wanted to. There's, there's all sorts of cameras out there that are live streaming. Yeah. So you're not at the Autobahn now, right? Yes, no, I, I'm in my office right now because the internet here is better than at my house. Yeah, well, that's interesting. And yeah, d by the way, just another word to the people. I know I typed it in the chat, but I think a couple of people might be having trouble with connection because they've been going in and out, but this is being recorded. So you can watch it in its entirety and you can even, yeah, I might even try to send the link around to everyone who registered just so they'll have it too as we get yeah. it up. It won't take me that long, probably, you know, later today or tomorrow, it should be up. And yeah, we've gotten some people saying thank you in the chat. It was a great presentation. And thanks everyone for coming. And we do hope, we do hope to see you guys. We do hope to have more programs coming up soon, although there won't be any till after the Thanksgiving holiday, but it should be pretty, you know, pretty soon. We'll start to get some things coming. And for those look at you know, and we our book groups are ongoing. Those are happening definitely every month. We have a fiction, nonfiction, and a virtual mystery group. So those are ongoing. And we'll definitely be having some more presentations soon. And again, thanks everyone for coming. And thanks, Chris. Oh, you're welcome. And keep an eye on uh, Mass Audubon's uh, program catalog for any of the pro uh, programs we have. We got some um, Zoom program Zoom programs coming up. Uh, or online web ones that are like related to birds, uh, birding by ear, and then there'll be an associated uh, outdoor walk uh, for, for those online uh, programs as well. So that's uh, a kind of a two-part series for those. Yeah, well, that's great. All right, have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.